more. A couple of years on, things are real horrible here in New York, all over. You're dealing with a lot of uh, people that are maniacs today. You're dealing with an individual who's very basic, who only knows two things, rip off or be ripped off. Many of those who make good by being bad are nowhere to be seen these days. I'd be afraid. Of course I'd be afraid. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. You ever wish there isn't anything on earth that I will hide from or back up from. People seem not to understand the close relationship between organized crime and street crime. And certainly in dealing with street crime in his area or any other kind of crime, uh, the uniform uh, patrol... Presenzano shot four times, his throat cut. Presenzano was allegedly connected. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome back to another episode of NYC Crime Spot. Today, I'm going to be joined by a very special guest. Our guest is a man who arrived to the United States in 1972 at the age of two years old. He would arrive from Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily. And years prior, his family had already come to the United States, some getting involved in the world of Italian organized crime, specifically the Bonanno crime family. It's a world that our guest would enter into later on in his life. However, today we're going to be speaking about our guest's beginnings in the United States and the neighborhood where he landed in in 1972, that neighborhood being Bushwick, Brooklyn, and our guest being Frank Fiordolino. Frank, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you for having me. How are you? Good, buddy. You doing well? Yeah, yeah, not bad, not bad. Hanging in there. Big fan, big fan, man. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. And, yeah, yeah. You know, thank you so much for coming on. And I know that you have made the rounds on YouTube a bit. Um, and generally, the discussion, of course, is always about the mafia and you know your family and how you entered into that world. But I thought today, Frank, we would do something a little different. And I really would like to speak about the neighborhood, as I said in the opening there, that you landed in when you came here in, in 1972, that neighborhood of Bushwick, Brooklyn. So just thinking back, Frank, when you came here, you were two years old. So do you have any – what would be your earliest memory um, from coming into the United States into Brooklyn? Um. The Johnny Bumps, the, you know, those uh, mobile rides that used to come around. Like, there was one that used to rock back and forth called the King Kong. And uh, it was a quarter to get on. And uh, it used to play that theme, if anybody's familiar with Three Dog Nights, uh, the show must go on. And it, and it just was so exciting to come up the block. Uh, the Johnny Pumps, because, or the fire hydrants, because they were always on. And then the kids like to go through the sprinklers, especially on those Hot summer uh, New York City days, you know. I don't didn't remember nothing of back home. When I mean back home, I'm talking about Sicily because I did come in when I was two. So my 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 memories of uh, my childhood memories rather are, are those of Hemrod Street and Knickerbocker Avenue. You know, we uh, when my family first landed here in the United States, um, that was one of the things I remember, the ice cream trucks. I mean, what kid didn't like ice creams? There was Mr. Softy, and, and the music used to come around. Everybody used to sit on the stoops at nighttime. I remember that finally. I remember the snow. I mean, when it snowed, the kids played rough tackle football, you know, and uh, right on the street. And in the summertime, it was stickball. Everybody played stickball. You know, I, I was lucky enough to be – one of the last generations to see those kind of games that uh, you'd only see in New York City. You know what I mean? You had the stick ball, the, 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 the Johnny and the Pony, Ringolario, uh, the 4th of July, where, where there was always one guy that bought more fireworks than everybody else, and they all used to go up at nighttime wait to go see what uh, this guy was about to do. You know, or we used to just get our hands, even at a small age, eight, nine years old, we used to get our hands on firecrackers and 
it, it was just a very innovative, creative. Day. You had to do. You invented yourself in those days. You know, you you did things and very congested. By the way, we lived in a uh, six unit, I believe, four room apartment building, and uh, for the most part, everybody was like on top of each other. You, you don't realize it until. You don't live in those kind of conditions, and you say, "Wow, <laughs> you know, it was it was pretty uh, congested." Yeah, and I gotta ask for for those wondering, why Bushwick? Why did um, your family end up in Bushwick? Apparently, I mean, because it was a prominently Sicilian neighborhood when we first got there, and not only that, our families were there before us. I had a godfather. And his family, um, Joe Pizzo, that lived on St. Nicholas Avenue, and they lived there. I had an uncle who lived on a block down on Stanhope years before my uncle John. So it seemed like everybody, and not everybody, anybody that we were close to from our town, obviously, friends or family, um, immigrated to Bushwick. And, and, and even the shops, like the coffee shops that we'll get into, they were they were kind of like havens for these people that were from the other side to come together and talk about, you know, the old country, whatever, whatever news they got back then. You got to remember, um, there was no phones, Internet, anything like that. So when somebody got news of something that happened in the town, you know, especially somebody who was your paisan. And when I mean paisan, I'm talking about somebody who's from your town. We call each other paisans. You know, it, it, it kind of it reciprocated. You know, the news got out, and that was big. But we had a lot of Castello Medis living there. We had a we had a fish market owned by two Castello Medis, one one on one block, one on the other. We had pizzerias. Uh, you, you know, we kind of like patronized our own. But if somebody else was offering something like the Italian store, we had a we had an Italian import store at the time. Uh, before San Pellegrino was even a thing, they were carrying the San Pellegrino products, you know, and uh, from the other country. Now everybody has a San Pellegrino <laughs> water. But before that, they had the lemonada, yeah. which was the lemonade, the aranciata, was, you know, all that stuff. And you'd get it like there was a place on Saddam and Nicobaca called uh, Bari Foods, and they were there forever, you know. I think they might still be there. I'm not sure. But um, even up to today, even when people moved out of the neighborhood, which we'll get into also, um, people would come back from Queens, especially, you know, uh, and uh, Long Island. They would come to that store. A lot of people would. It, it did really well. Yeah, and you know, that's like a, it's a tale as old as time. I mean, you have whether it be the Italians or the Jews in the Lower East Side in the early 20th century or. Even where I grew up in Queens, you have the Chinese and the Koreans coming in. You all come in. You you know you create your little enclave. You patronize your your community and you try to build yourselves up. You know you're coming to a new country, and you try to build up the neighborhood. But you had family that came here before. And I said in the beginning, I don't want to get too much into the organized crime uh, in this discussion, but. You did have family that was already here, kind of making a name for themselves in organized crime. All right. Can yeah, you just, yeah. very little, yeah. can you just touch on that a little bit, Frank? Yeah, we did. And and my, uh, an uncle, we had two uncles actually. One that was my, my mother's brother. And the other one was my father's brother. My father's brother, John, my uncle, uh, Frank Navarro was uh, my mother's brother. And we had my, my uh, godfather, who was also my first cousin, and he was here. He was also a member of the Banano family. So right there, there was three members. Um, and, and there was other members who got inducted later on. But that was that they were here already. And what, what was good about that, there was pros and cons on that, all right? Cons are always that, you know, people look at you differently. They just don't say nothing, but, you know. They kind of look down some people. And the other one, and the other cons were that it wasn't hard getting a job for us, you know, or even getting um, situated, if you will. We weren't really poor. My father lost his job in Italy, and everybody was talking about how good they were doing it. And uh, my mom just picked up and left, you know, okay. with all of us, of course. And we yeah. took a boat over. <laughs> 
Oh, you actually took a boat. Yeah, we did. We did. Wow. Yeah, we took a boat. And uh, we had stuff that we were bringing back, you know, um, that she wanted to bring with us. I think my mother at that point felt that she was making the move for good. And um, my father was in totally with it. You know, he grew up in the mountains. And it was a cultural shock to him. But he went with the family, and that's what he did. Yeah, yeah. So as a as a kid growing up, you know, you're running the streets. We spoke prior. Um, your family business, you, you have a coffee shop. Is that correct? Kind well, of that comes later point. on. Yeah, that would comes later on. This is actually be after we moved from Bushwick around. Uh, okay. My brother gets involved in, um, you know, his friends organized crime. We we kind of just that that was our path. And later on. that was later on. He bought a coffee shop. That was on Nickabaca. See, what happened was when everybody left Nickabaca Avenue, um, my brothers, my two brothers, one's eight years older than me and the other one was 11 years older than me, were pretty much uh, situated already or stuck on that neighborhood. They, they found it a little bit more probably difficult to uh, adapt to Bridge with Fresh Pond Road, which didn't have that many Italians. And they weren't the only ones. People on their age group, even though they moved out of uh, Bushwick, they used to come back to Bushwick. There was three coffee shops they still came back to. There was uh, the stores. And their friends used to come there, which was understandable. I mean, um, I moved when I was nine. One of my brothers was 17. So he spent most of his um, adolescence there. So his friends were there. They would go to the coffee shops and hang out. I, I adapted more of American kind of lifestyle. You know, I played mm -hmm. baseball. I did the things the American kids did. My friends at the time were mostly um, born here in, in the United States, where theirs wasn't. Right, right. So your first language, is it a Sicilian? Oh, absolutely. I right. spoke Sicilian. And um, back then, in the, in the in, in, especially in Bushwick, um, I remember I went to PS 86 on Irving and Harmon. They had a okay. bilingual program and, you know, the uh, teachers talked to us in both Italian and English because a lot of my uh, fellow students, the kids in the school that, I mean, especially my class were kids that Italian was their first language. Well, Sicilian um, at home, you know, we had a very few novel at uh, mostly Sicilians, but, or even Bares, you know, but, Southern Italian for sure, and mostly and mostly of uh, were Sicilians. Okay, okay, but your years. Uh, so you did spend a little bit of time in elementary school in Bushwick, and you were you were you lived there till you were nine years old. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, and I we're going to talk about. Oh, go ahead, Frank. I'm sorry. I, I believe it was until the third grade, and then and then we moved to Ridgewood, and I started. In Ridgewood, and they, they sent me back actually <laughs> because I was so that you know they were advanced. I went to a Catholic school after, and being that Sicilian was my second, um, my first language actually. It was it was kind of hard in the beginning to adapt. Okay, okay. So you were in Bushwick through through basically throughout uh, from when you came here basically till the end of the seventies. However, you did move to Ridgewood, but you still spent a lot of time in Bushwick. That's correct. That's correct because um, okay. once my brothers, I, we still had family there. We'd go back or right. friends. My mom would have friends. We'd go back there and see. And not only that, they did their shopping there. You had the the supermarkets had Italian products. The uh, body, as we spoke, had Italian products. We had the fish market. My mom used to love to go to the fish market where where the person that's from her same town, um, you know, w w was her vendor, you know. Right. And right. And, and, and that was on um, Nickabaka Avenue as well. So they would go back. And eventually my brothers fall into um, this coffee shop in 1983. And I started working there immediately. Uh, yep, that's it. 
So that's 274 Knickerbocker Avenue, Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York City. That's right across the street from at that time, which was known as a park. By the I think it was just called Bushwick Park. Is that correct? We called it Knickerbocker Park. It's between the Dam and Star, and then the middle street is Williamsburg. No, William Willoughby, and then Willoughby acts as a dead. The the park acts as a dead end right there. Okay. Okay. And, and that, it's a, it, it's amazing. I'm looking at the picture, and it brings back so many memories. Uh, yeah. Serving ice cream and coffee from that little window on the left. Wow. See the doors on the right. Yeah. And then eventually they fixed the storefront. Mm -hmm. And um, it and looks that says Conca de Oro. Is that what that says? That was the original uh, name of the place, Conca de Oro. And and, and, okay. and and I think upstairs used to be. I'm pretty sure I used to hear that. Uh, don't quote me on this, uh, but I'm pretty sure it used to be Mario Como's uh, office. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, I mean either people or something, something of the, yeah, I I'm not sure. All right. Yeah. So we got all that background. It's really important because we're going to be talking about some very kind of uneasy topics. And it's interesting to talk to you because, you know, talking to you, it's like, you're viewing this basically civil unrest that we're going to be discussing through the eyes of a child. And, and it's very interesting to talk to somebody like you as who was a young child at the time, absorbing basically what was going on in Bushwick at that time. And I want to show everybody some pictures right now. So you can kind of get an idea of what areas of this neighborhood would have looked like at that time. Now, these pictures are from the early eighties and we're going to talk a lot about the seventies, but if, if you guys just, so here we got an empty lot here. This is on three eighty four Melrose street right over here. We have Knickerbocker Avenue. This is a completely empty lot, which more than likely encompassed some buildings at one point that were either arsoned or vacant and unsafe. You have all this garbage here we have another uh, 1162 Flushing Avenue, another empty lot. Here we have Jefferson Street, piles and piles of garbage, another empty lot. So, so you have this, this imagery of what looks like almost, in a sense, Frank, a war-torn area. Um, what do you recall about like some of the imagery that I just showed you? Does that spark any memories for you? Yeah. Um, the neighborhoods definitely started deteriorating. Um I would say around 1977, the first the blackout that led to the looting and right. the business owners that were there for like 50 years, uh, whatever, 25 years, they just decided to uh, to pack it in and move and they were looking to, to cash out a lot of them and, they were, and the little investment they had left. So it wasn't rare to see a lot of fires around that time, 77, 78. A lot of the yeah. folks were moving out. Uh, a lot of people were moving out to uh, Long Island, Queens, mostly, you know, that direction. And uh, and, and, and the neighborhood was starting that we were having, a, there was a, Italians were getting out and a lot of the Puerto Ricans were coming in, Puerto Rican uh, residents. They were coming either from Puerto Rico or whatever. And they started uh, moving into Bushwick around that time as well. Yeah, you mentioned fires, and that's going to be a big topic of our, our discussion. And let's – basically, you mentioned 1977 um, when it got really bad, and of course that is true. Now, prior to that, there were some fires, and you know, I have some stuff that – and I want to read something actually from the Daily yeah. News, uh, Frank, from 1977. Bushwick is a place where people sleep with their clothes on and their bags packed, where parents often alternate on fire watch. It is a section of 120,000 souls and 6,000 fire calls a year. A sixth of them in buildings. It is a section of blackened, abandoned homes, block after block, and weed-choked lots where buildings once stood. A section of hideous, rubble-strewn desolation. A section that loses a house a day to fire. Now we have some stat in 1976. This is official reports. 200 buildings in Bushwick were declared unsafe between January 1st and June 30th, 1976, 807 fires struck Bushwick. 142 of those were deemed suspicious fires. The following year in 77, 
they would state that as much as 1,000 of Bushwick's 12,000 buildings were vacant or burned down. And in January to June 77, another 804 fires, 260 of them were deemed suspicious fires. Okay. And if people want to know what suspicious is now, according to officials at the time, Frank, these were some of the reasons why these things happened. You had bored kids with nothing else to do. You had members of teen gangs who were paid anywhere from $250 to $450 by greedy landlords who were after insurance. This third one is probably the saddest frightened parents seeking a high spot on the city's relocation list. So these families figured out, well, if I burn my apartment down, the city has to relocate me to a better neighborhood. And last but not least, professional tortures hired by men with failing businesses. When I read all that to you, Frank, what do you have to say to that? What do you I remember? Pretty accurate. I mean, that's what was going on. It just seemed like I was seven, eight years old. There was a fire every other day. And I, I mean, it got so bad. It was either the smell of fire or um, when it rained, finally it would rain. You'd smell, you know, you ever smell that burnt wood? That yes. smell of burnt wood. And I mean, it, when there's a lot of wood that's been burnt, and that smell used to just cover the air as well. It was really, it, Bushwick was deteriorating and fast. I mean, people were getting out. The The idea of people burning their palms to get relocated. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. It, a place, like I said, was congested for a person that's trying to build a family there um you want it out and especially as it was getting worse um gotta remember there's a lot of things going around in the 70s especially in that time kids were getting a lot of kids a lot of immigrants italian as well were getting into heroin um mm -hmm. angel dust the drugs epidemic which would lead to the crack eventually after in the 80s was starting to to spin so it, it was like you know, uh, the Grim Reaper showing up in, 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 in Bushwick, a lot of stuff was going on. And we, and that was around the time with, with uh, it, it seemed like a lot was going on for a seven, eight year old kid. You had the son of Sam, you know, right. Right. Come, the son of Sam and uh, the, all the kids just thinking, being scared off, scared for their lives, you know. And we used to play those games like in that movie, the, the son of Sam tag and, um, we would worry, and, and, and there was just so much part of New York that's going on just in Bushwick. Yeah, and that's why I think it's an important conversation because, you know, obviously we all we all know what the 70s were like. I mean, I wasn't alive, but from, you know, a historical perspective, we know how dangerous the 70s were. We know about the civil unrest, the um, the complete squandering of, of all, all of the money problems that the city had, all the problems with the unions, the police unions, the fire unions. It's just the list goes on. But one of the things we often hear, uh, Frank, it's, it's, it's a popular catchphrase. The Bronx is burning. The Bronx is burning. Wow. But, you know, in a sense, you had other neighborhoods like Bushwick, which is probably just as bad. And, you know, the idea of Bushwick burning, I don't think it's as much out there. And you see, look, I want to show you this. This is a this is a quote from the fire from the fire uh, chief, I believe. They call a gas can an overnight bag. They started calling gas cans Bushwick overnight bags. That, oh, that's yeah. a quote from from a fireman. You see photos here Our dying neighborhoods. This is a uh, broken glass looking down on the children in the, in the area. It, it, um, here's this image again. And, you know, the all of this imagery, here you go. This is Bushwick, you know. And, you know, we hear so much about the Bronx. We hear about Harlem, this and that, Lower East Side. But, you know, I think Bushwick, at least for me, is a little bit, flies a little bit under the, under the radar. If you could add anything uh, to that, Frank. Um, It flies under, you're saying. Um, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I think a lot had to do with it. Uh, people were placed quickly. People found, um, what do you do with the uh, low-income families? They found a place once the, the lower middle class left right away. So it wasn't so, I'm like, what are we going to do? There was nobody really complaining. And people, and I wouldn't say content with that. How can you be content living in that? But once the, 
the, the, the old left and the new came in, it was just, this is what it is. And they weren't making too much of a ruckus about it. Right, right. Interesting. But, uh, <clears throat> but pretty accurate. It, it was definitely a gas can. And yeah, it, I, I remember it well. And it, and it happened quick, okay? You know, it happened quick. It, this was from a neighborhood where I uh, used to have an Italian record store. Um, people used to go buy their 33s and their Italian albums or their Italian products from anywhere from their cologne to their tassels or whatever. Um, yeah, the bakeries, everything was the feast. They used to have the feast, different feasts for different towns, and they used to have them in uh, Knickerbocker Avenue or even on uh, Irving Avenue. I remember that. And then within just overnight, uh, I think the beginning of the end was definitely the blackout. Yeah, we're definitely going to speak about the blackout. We have some uh, interesting footage that, that I'm going to show as well. I just had one more question, uh, Frank. In the 1970s, as you mentioned before, you had a bit of a, a demographic shift in the area. You had a lot of Puerto Rican families coming in, a lot of Hispanic uh, people coming into the area. This gave birth to a lot of youth gangs. And as we'll learn later on in this conversation even many of the arsons and fires were started by uh, many of these Puerto Rican youth gangs. I have to ask Frank, you know, because you still had the Sicilian, uh, you know, people from Sicily who were involved in organized crime in that area. But then you had all this arson, you had all of these Puerto Rican youth gangs. Do you think in a sense, all of that noise was indirectly almost like a cover for what, some of these Sicilians might have been doing in that area sure. still? Sure. Uh, there was bigger fish to fry with the, we had the 83rd precinct right there on Myrtle Avenue. So you figure, I mean, what are they going to go after first? Uh, you know, the lives of innocent people being burnt to death or, or these buffoons <laughs> trying to make money. Um, right. The old, uh, the old fashioned way, who do you go after? You know what I mean? So don't get me wrong. They, they, we were, we were, Definitely the minor problems to uh, we, I mean, the people that were doing what they were doing back then right. compared to the uh, these fires. There was there was, there was crimes against uh, civilians, you know. Yeah. yeah. You know, robberies went up. Uh, drugs were coming more in abundance. And, uh, yeah, well, definitely under the radar. I, matter of fact, you had, to, going back to the coffee shops, it wasn't rare to get a, a couple of cops coming in for for a coffee or cappuccinos they would get. And they did just, where in my neighborhood in Ridgewood, they wouldn't come to the coffee shops in there because they were the spotlight where, like you said, we, we, we would openly in the 80s sit in front of the coffee shops and buy stolen goods from crackheads on their way to the, uh, to the crack houses or whatever there was. We'd just sit outside the door and you get everything. You know, you'd have... They'd come in, and sometimes you'd even get the people who got robbed asking you if they've seen any of their goods. So that that was what was going on, and the cops didn't care because, they, like I said, they had bigger fish to fry. Right, right. And you talk about the blackout. You talk about, so from the summer of 76 to the summer of 77, obviously you have David Berkowitz is running around shooting people, so you, so you got that thing going on. And this, well, the, yeah. you know. Well, that didn't, well, David Berkowitz didn't affect Bushwick. Um, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just saying the, the general um, tone uh, of the city. In New York, it's just a scared place. Uh, yeah. uh, we're a little bit older and interested. The music was different. I remember when the Puerto Ricans came into the neighborhood, there would be salsa dancing on the streets with their music. And, and it was it was nice. It was cool, you know. Um, yeah. I got a lot of Puerto Rican friends today. They, they were just – and it gradually turned into a Puerto Rican neighborhood. And then later on, some Dominicans in the 80s. But that's yeah. – that was uh, that was it, right? Well, you did mention before the the blackouts, kind of like almost like the climax of shit, just really going down the toilet. And you know, I mentioned Berkowitz just just as like a tone, a uh, general tone of the city. You had the serial killer running around shooting people, and right. then you had the blackout in July of of uh, seventy seven. And I'm going to show some footage, Frank. This is actually from Bushwick taken when the blackout hits is it's from july 13th 1977 so everybody can kind of get an idea of what a fire in bushwick looks like in action and i labeled who actually uh filmed this and 
when it happened. So let's let's add this. Let's let's take a look at this. You have the fireman there. And of course, as we mentioned before, when something like that happens, this is what you're left with. I mean, this is Bushwick here. This is Bushwick. Here's another shot. I mean, and, and you're left with basic rubble. I mean, uh, really, it looks like we're looking at whatever Gaza looks like right now. I mean, that's what this and this is New York City. It's almost incredibly you know, hard for somebody like me to fathom, Frank. When you see something like video footage of that fire, does, does that... Do you almost smell the air just watching that? I kind I kind of remember watching the firemen in action. A couple of incidents. Um, I mean, who hasn't in New York City? You always, you know, there's fires growing up, and, and but this was like the sirens were the most. We we used to hear the sirens a lot, a uh, real lot. There was a fire, the fire station um, on Saint Nicholas, I think, in Emerald, a couple of blocks away. And, um, you know, people started, start, you know, people started uh, worrying about their, their children and all. And if they could have got out, they did. And we, and we eventually did around 79. 79. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, how often fires were serious fires, not little fires. I mean, that was July 13th, July 18th, your neighborhood would, would get hit with another extraordinary historical fire which takes place at 244 Bleecker Street now. And here is here is um, what would remain after that. Um, I'll show you guys this photo again. And the interesting thing about about this fire, Frank, is, as I mentioned before, you had a lot of youths running around for whatever reason, partaking in arson. Now, that particular fire that took place on on Bleecker Street, just to give everybody an idea you know, this is the this is the article that relates to to who started this fire. I mean, that was a big one. Eighteen year old John D'Amico, sixteen uh, year old John Rivera, twelve year old boy who is unnamed. And if we look at the bottom here, this um, this is a I believe a ten what they refer to as a ten alarm fire. You have twenty uh, buildings being affected, most of them homes along several blocks. About two hundred people were left homeless from this fire. And these are, once again, as we looked at those uh, stats earlier, um, essentially bored kids or kids in trouble thinking that I'm going to start a fire. Um, yeah. Do you remember that particular? I incident, do. Right? I remember that building uh, perfectly. I remember that whole block. It looked like a bomb hit it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and it took them a while to fix them. They were boarded up for a long time, whatever was left of them. And Once that, again, was, this is that a, was, I believe, between Knickerbocker and Irving. Okay. If I'm right, if I'm correct, it was a long time ago. You got to remember, I would return to that neighborhood until I was older and almost, almost close to my 30s. Okay. I think you're right. That I think that the main thing is Knickerbocker there and then the actual spot, 244 Bleecker, which is where – this bookstore was Ruth and Sam bookshop. Yeah. And that's kind of where shit really set off. And then it just spread. It just it was basically scary. spread. It was really scary. Um, I, I remember that fire. It was the eyewitness news was there and uh, I, it was huge. And, 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 and the sky, it was a hot day too. And the sky was, you know, a lot, a lot of smoke, you know, that black smoke from fires, and, but it was a lot. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had an issue a few months back with the Canadian wildfires. Um, and in New York City, you know, we, we were smelling smoke every day. The air quality was shitty. But I, I can't imagine, Frank, just living in a neighborhood 
where our total blocks were on fire. I mean, it's just, it's a completely different element, you know, just to wake up every day and smell that, let alone, you know, I'm smelling something from Canada. You're, you know, something right in the neighborhood. It must've been quite an experience. I remember taking the uh, subway, the, the M train from um, Knickerbocker and from the Knickerbocker station to uh, Fresh Pond Road. I think that was four or five stops. I think it was, so you had Wyckoff, Far, Wyckoff, Seneca, Forest, and Fresh, five, four stops from Knickerbocker. And you could take that train all the way to Fresh Pond Road. And, and from that Knickerbocker to Wyckoff station, is that the you L? That? It looked like a fucking bomb hit it. Jesus. It was bad. It was really, really bad. I think the highlight of our neighborhood was when they opened up a Burger King right there in uh, on Myrtle Ave. <laughs> Is that <laughs> right? Why do, you, why do you say that? Oh, because we didn't have no, com no commercial places, really. That was like the first one. There was a Burger King there. I think it might still be there. Um... And I remember it well because they 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 were they had an advert not they were advertising they were giving away Yankee glasses with all the Yankee players, and and that was like a highlight you know that was the closest I ever got to see the baseball game you know uh, at that age at that age later on of course I used to take the bus to go see the Mets all the time when I lived in Ridgewood, but uh yeah it, it was it was. It was, you know, Burger King was huge, especially when you were a kid, you know? Yeah, yeah. We had a Woolworths on Fresh Pond, not Fresh Pond Road, that's later on. We had a Woolworths on Knickerbocker. We had a donut shop across the street. We had a pizza place on Hemrod Street called Nick's Pizza. I think I talked to, talked to you yeah. about this. It was one of the best pizza I ever had. And get this, the guy was Cuban. Uh, Nick's Pizza was great pizza. And um, wow. I remember talking about to Vito Grimaldi about that years years after. And he said, yes, it was good pizza. His wife, I guess, lived on him right at one time and he used to get pizza. He, he told, and he knows, he knew a lot about baking. He goes, Cubans are very good bakers. I said, oh, but that pizza was just, I still could taste it today. It was just probably the, one of the best pizzas I've had in my life. Um, you know, Grimaldi I, being uh, Grimaldi Bakery, correct? Grimaldi Bakery, correct. And uh, on Decap, there was Tony's Pizza. I don't know if Tony's still alive. Tony Rizzo. And uh, his pizza Sicilians were really good, too. I missed that. You had Chico's Bakery on Hart Street. Um, then you had all three coffee shops. You had the Cafe de Vial. You had the Bala Palermo in uh, Sedan. There was another one. I forgot the name. I think like Abanal or something like that. I was on uh, the same side. of, uh, But I vaguely remember that one. Um. And there was there, and then of course there was the one my brother opened up, the Concadoro. Concadoro, yeah. It was one on decal, I think it was Kono's, and that was uh just where all the fucking hoodlums swung <laughs> one of my <laughs> brother's <laughs> friends. Uh so you know, that was the life that was the life they were having back at the time. And it got disrupted. They had they moved, they couldn't live there anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. You had the park, yeah. let's not forget the park, the Nickabaka Park, we call it like, some people call it Bushwick Park. Uh, yeah. the perimeters were uh, Nickabock on one side, so damn, and then you had Star, and then you had Irving Avenue, and um, that was where everybody, my brother, one of my brothers used to go play softball there with his friends, and he worked for my uncle at the time, right there on Saddam. He had a construction come, uh, two guys, constru two guys, was it two star construction? Two and star my, construction, yeah, my uncle Cheech. You know, he gave my brother a job early on as a kid. He was probably the smartest out of all of us. And he gave him like a secretary job. He was like 10 while he was learning English. And he was pretty good at it too. Yeah, no, it's fascinating, man. Because, you know, as you probably know, I mean, Bushwick today is what we would call what became known as oh, one of the hipster epicenters of New York City. I believe, I believe in an article a few years back, it was named one of the coolest neighborhoods, not only in New York, but I believe in the – in the United States. Um, I first got exposed to Bushwick almost 10 years ago. I had a friend who was an artist that, that moved into there and I had no idea about the neighborhood, but I went there and I was like, you know, as a kid, you know, I heard about Bushwick bad, this and that. All I saw was a bunch of white hipsters with tattoos and piercings running around. 
Um, of course, you still have the the Puerto Rican element that has been there for many decades that is still holding it down. But you know, to to juxtapose that with you know what we're talking about now, it, it's it's just a completely different world. It's unfathomable that the neighborhoods over there looked like this at one point. You know, yeah, it's, I know, it's really yeah, hard to believe. And you know, it's it's important, I think, to remember this this stuff. And I'm sure ma many people there. Or not even from New York City, Frank. Many people that encompass that neighborhood. Oh no, so, I was just I was you know I think I, I talked to you about that too. My friend's daughter, she goes, I was up in New York. I said, Where were you? She goes, Bushwick and uh, uh Bushwick is it's really nice. I like it. She's a little hipster, you know. She goes, Here's this twenty five year old blonde headed kid and she's walking around walking nigga I said, Watch out, man, that neighborhood's dangerous. She goes, No, it was not dangerous at all. I listen, I still wouldn't walk. You know, I I would recommend they don't walk on a dark street at nighttime in Bush even today. You know, some of the elements still there, man. I I don't believe they all just left. You know. Yeah, yeah. At one point in time, this is just a question for myself. Was there some kind of curfew in that area at one point? Do you recall? I don't remember, but I know they had makeshift uh, precincts. One was right in the park, and this is a little bit at before I would say. Or a little bit after the Maria Hernandez situation, yeah, which we'll yeah. speak about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I ask, yeah, <laughs> I asked you that question because I have this weird memory as a child where, like, we were broke. I don't even know what we were doing there. We were looking for a Christmas tree, and I recall being in the car with my parents, and I remember it clearly. We ended up on Knickerbocker Avenue, and I remember my mother in the car saying, "Oh, what the hell are we doing here? There's like this neighborhood's terrible. There's they even got a curfew over here. Why did you take us here?" And this is like a weird memory I remember from a child. That's why I had it. But this has been like the early to mid '90s, way after that. But I just remember that that memory. Yeah, I remember. I remember the uh, one time the phones went out. You know, the landlines. Uh -huh. And this was about 87, 88. And this is when the neighborhood was bad. We were at the coffee shop. And I don't know what my, what happened. They were, they were, it wasn't a long. It was like 10 hours, 12 hours. So you see the 83rd precinct. The cars are driving around with their lights on. All of them. So my dumbass brother, which is my oldest. She's not the brightest one. Um, he goes, what the fuck is going on? He's very street shot, smart, but you know that's about it. He goes, what the fuck is going on? I go, you don't get it? The lands, well, the fuck, the phones are off. If somebody's got a cop, they got to run in front of these cars, you know, because of the lights. They're telling they're there. You know, they had more cars. That it, it was weird. <laughs> he goes, he didn't know why. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was very, very high crime neighborhood, you know. I remember there was a, uh, the reporters, the show with Steve Dunlavey called that block on, I think it was Troutman or Star and Nickabot, the most dangerous street in the United States. That's unbelievable. Wow. Okay, this is this is a show that covers, you know, the uh, national show, national, uh, and they they cat and they covered that block. Unbelievable. So, as you mentioned earlier, your family leaves Bushwick, basically moves, you know, I say down the road, you know, not far. Uh, into Ridgewood, right? Correct. Now, is that pre or post Galante hit? About the same time. About the same time. We move in June. I think he gets killed. When is it again? Uh, August. July, I believe. July. Okay, yeah. so there you go. Of 79. I remember it well. I remember it well. Um, my dad used to go to uh, his pizza shop uh, right there in, well, that would be called Williamsburg now. Uh, Leo and Sons, and now Leo was one of the people that was murdered that day. Uh, and that's uh, Le Leonardo Coppola, and my dad and him were really good friends. So I remember we always used to go there. And my dad, me being the younger one, he used to like to, to he was a lot old, <laughs> he had me old, and he used to like to take me around, whatever. That's that's what dads do, I guess. He was like, he, he, people see him, he was like my grandfather, you know. And uh, that was one of uh, the highlights when I moved to Fresh Pond Road because I didn't know many people going with my dad to go to go to the pizza shop. There was a movie theater across the street on Marcy and Broadway, and I used to uh, go there. So I remember it well. I was living on Fresh Pond Road. We had just moved. 
from Bushwick to Fresh Pond. Okay. And that was, uh, I believe, 205 Knickerbocker Avenue. That's where that takes That's place. That's where Mary's is 205. Yeah, where yeah. the coffee shop is, what, 247? Yeah, that was right here, 274 Knickerbocker. Right. Um, I always get those, that 274 yeah. mixed up because my, my, my house on Hemrod Street was 247. I, I'm pretty sure okay. 247. Okay. So now you're in Ridgewood into the into the eighties, and but you're still spending a lot of time in Bushwick, and I, and I want to get into really stay with Bushwick and what's going on in Bushwick at, at that time. And you had, of course, as we mentioned, you had a lot of um, Puerto Ricans that had moved in, and ultimately, you know, many of those youth gangs, either those kids straightened out and they got their shit together, or they stayed into a life of crime entering into their twenties and thirties, what have you. And now they start becoming heroin dealers, cocaine dealers. Of course you had crack. Do you sure. recall that dynamic going back to Bushwick? So you had, let's say the Sicilians. I mean, you had a guy, of course, like Galante selling a lot of drugs. You had whoever was there at that time. You would know more than me probably pushing drugs on the Italian side. But then you had this, these Hispanic gangs also pushing drugs do you recall what that dynamic was like? Well, I was very young when 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 Galante was doing his thing, so I didn't know yeah. what the hell was going on. Um, the closest <laughs> closest thing I knew to, to drugs was that that dopey guy that used to, um, uh, you know, you know, run around naked on angel dust. <laughs> the guy on the roof, we used to see that now and then, uh, okay. and we'd be like, "Oh, that guy's on drugs," but we didn't know. We, we to us, it was like pills. We kids, you know, but. Once I start moving and I'm, I'm like 12, 13 years old and I see what's going on, the kids on the corner yelling, whistling when, when they see a strange car or, or on Nickabock Avenue, you know, on my way home to Fresh Pond Road, um, they, they, you see that it was evident. It was, it, they were in hiding. There was abandoned buildings, people coming out of it, um, feeding the kid his stuff so he could sell. You have these young kids selling, just like the wire. Yeah. And, and and that's what it was most like. It was it was that's that's the dynamic. Not of course the Italian American, no, the, the Italian uh, part was on such a high level. I mean, compared to the street level, um, it, it's kind of like weird because it's it's like a chain that these guys are probably bringing this stuff in that's going to get processed, stepped on, and then these kids are eventually one way or the other going to sell the product that these guys were wagging out in the in these uh in these coffee shops and restaurants brought into the country. I mean, just, well, that's exactly what I mean. Like that, I that type, to, of, that type of dynamic. Do you think it was that dynamic where it was the Italians doing the real heavy lifting at the top? And then it's just, like you said, it just funnels down and gets stepped on. And then it ends up into the hands of. I, no, I feel that, I feel that one way or another, it, it, it came from somewhere. Uh, do I think, that the pizza connection drugs ended up on freaking Nickabock Abbey. No, I, I can't say that's a, that's a shot in the dark. You know what I mean? But is there a possibility? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was right. wondering if it was like some kind of clash with the Puerto Ricans and the Italians at that time. Uh, Not um, over drugs. No, no, no. Okay. There was just a different level. If there was a clash, it was over adolescent stuff, high school stuff, you know? Um, okay. You'd had a lot of these gangs fight over uh, just simple stuff. You being Italian and the other one being Puerto Rican, or you know, and you had that in the black and Puerto Rican neighborhoods. They'd fight each other, right, right, um, not right. not on an organized crime level. Okay, you know, okay. if there was Puerto Ricans who were in an organized crime that were dealing with Italians, it's because they were grew up grew up with Italians, and I did see that as well. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Good to know. So. I'm going to talk about into the 80s. I mean, of course, as we mentioned, you moved into Ridgewood, but you did I mean, spend a lot get, of Don't get me wrong real quick. <laughs> Is it possible that there was a couple of Sicilians who were selling drugs to Puerto Ricans? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, was, that, was that the makeup? No. Okay. Okay. You know. Yeah. No, because it's just interesting. You have a huge demographic shift. You still have some of the old guard hanging around in the coffee shops or whatever, and you have all this chaos going on. I, I, I just... Wondered if there was kind of a clash of cultures going on, but I guess those guys are just trying to stay in the coffee shop, trying to stay low key and doing doing whatever they were doing. 
Yeah, I mean that's what I got anyway. Uh, okay. As far as that being there, there wasn't it, it, there was interaction. A couple of Puerto Rican guys, uh, no, a couple, couple of Italian guys getting with some Puerto Rican girls was <laughs> about the that that was that was more uh, <laughs> of course expected expected. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like Latin women? You know. Yeah. Yeah. So we spoke before about what you would call Knickerbocker Park. Some people refer to it as Bushwick Park. Today we know it by another name. And I want to get into that story. This is something that happens in the late 1980s, uh, 89 uh, specifically. And I'm going to bring up uh, a picture here. 105 Star Street, 4.38 a.m., August 8th, 1989. 34-year-old mother of three, Maria Hernandez, is shot dead inside her home once again at 105 Star Street, Bushwick, Brooklyn. And that is the building that you see right there. And here is Maria Hernandez right here. She lost her life at 34 years old, August 8th, 1989. Now, before this happens, Frank, there's a couple of things that are going on uh, before this happens. On, on her block specifically and, and around the immediate area, it, it came to a point where some of the people in the community, rightly so, were, were a little sick of the open se- selling of, you know, they have kids. She has three kids. People literally next door to them are openly selling drugs. You know, when your neighbor's selling drugs to somebody, you know, you're going to go to the store and you're going to see that drug addict on the floor. And you're going to look at your neighbor like, you know, it's this whole chain of events that, starts affecting regular working people. And before this happens, July 29th, 1977, her her husband, Carlos Hernandez, he actually gets stabbed twice by a neighbor on the block uh, after he is feuding with his neighbors over the constant open, out in the open selling of drugs and everything that comes along with that. And years prior to that, he was actually shot twice by local gangs. And this all culminates in his wife's murder which was actually a drive-by shooting where they drove by the house on star street and sprayed up the house and she just happened to be getting ready for work at around 5 a.m right her life frank what do you remember about this story i remember that she was getting ready for work that was a big it was a big story it was a big new york city story at the time and um as she was getting ready for work um, bullets rang through her, through her window and she got hit in the temple one shot and that was it. She was dead. Um, then, then the backstory came out of that and just to find out that they were feuding with the drug dealers in their neighborhood for a while, you know? And I remember too, that there was, a, you know, fake stories going around trying to tell people that, that, uh, basically that, you know, he was involved, the husband was involved in drugs, and that was a payback. Not that that made it right, but that wasn't true. The truth to that right. was, and they looked into that, that they were uh, they were victims. They were victims. They were trying to do the right thing in their neighborhoods, and um, they wanted them out. They were being, a, uh, they were starting to be a disturbance, a nuisance to these drug dealers, and she paid the price with her life. She would, She died fighting the war on drugs she was you know right. and, and and that's what happened after they had all these uh rallies they're trying to get all the uh they had a lot of raids that time too right after that happened they were raiding everybody they weren't they weren't stopping they marched right there on Nicobaca. i mean i remember the marches yeah oh, yeah wow. this was a march that took place a three mile march um from bushwick to cypress hill cemetery where she was being wow! Late, yeah. being laid to rest, which is uh, you know like three miles. It's a it's a nice little trip to take through the neighborhood. It's a pretty long trip. Um, it is a long trip. A long tell trip. me, tell me about this immediate area though, Frank. Uh, One hundred and five Star Street. Okay, now that block right there. Once you come from Nickabock, it's going uh, one way towards. It's a one way street that goes from Nickabock to to. Um, Irving, so more than likely if they were coming from Nickabock all the way up to Irving when they shot her. Um, what I remember about that block is they had guys in the middle that would whistle if a car was really um, suspicious. If they didn't see the car, and they would whistle. And then by the time that one guy whistled, there was another guy that if he knew the car, he would say hold. Or if he didn't, the guy in the corner, 
let's say if it was cops, they, they were already running because they were the guys who would do the dope. You know, they were, and they were there every fucking day, every day. Um, you know, that was their spot. It was just like the wire. Um, one yeah. day I'm going home and I see a body right on the floor. You could tell it was a young kid. I seen his sneakers. Wow. And uh, the detectives were there, obviously. And I, I see the, uh, you know, they wrapped them up. On, on, um, that's what type of place it was. Nobody went in the park. Back then, nobody went in the park at night. It, it was it was a park. It was, they, they tried to close the park all the time, you know. But it, it was, unless they knew. We were lucky. I mean, me and my brothers, lucky to the sense. We didn't have a problem with the drug dealers because the drug dealers don't have problems with civilians. It's the crackheads you have to watch out. The ones who will kill you for that five dollars because the the drug dealers they 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 just if they know you they'll just wave and you wave back and you go do your thing. You know you go your way they go theirs. Right. They just they, right. you know they're there for the money whatever. I mean, but it, it but there was a lot of zombies out there a lot. Yeah, and, and that's what I was yeah, and that's what I'm getting to. You know, before Frank when I mentioned it's like you know it's one thing for some guy from you know, whatever, Greenpoint or whatever, I, you know, some, let's just say from some white dude or whatever, oh, I got to go to Bushwick to score. He goes in his car and he drives back to Greenpoint to shoot up or do whatever he does. But it's another thing when you have like this vicious cycle playing out in front of your own eyes where it's like your neighbor is selling heroin and you can't even go to the store without seeing a fucking zombie because your neighbor is selling heroin, you know? So it, it just creates like this real you know, tension, I suppose, with, with people who are, who are against, you know, what's going on in that sense. Yeah. It's, it, if you stay in there, I mean, there was a lot of old timers that didn't want to leave. It was stuck in their own, you know, yeah, in their own ways. I, I knew a couple of Italians that had money that didn't want to leave because that was their home to them. They were content with those three blocks where they would go and get their stuff. For the most part, nobody messed with them. But there was also a time in the 80s where the wilding stuff was going, like the Central Park kind of deal. You, you, you'd you see that in Bushwick as well. You know, yeah. if I was working now, they didn't give a shit who I was. If you're a 15, 16-year-old kid and and about eight, nine nine kids right there, they, they'd jump you. It was, a, it, it was in a rare thing. They'd jump you, take your sneakers, whatever the, whatever the hell it was. And um, it was so bad that, you know, you, you always, when you're in a bad neighborhood, you usually have to watch out of the side streets. It got yeah. so bad. Even yeah. the freaking avenue was, was uh, you could have got freaking stripped, you know? So that that was that. I kind of got immune to it. My brothers were immune to it already because they've been there. Um, I, There was times I remember I just couldn't. I, I just wanted to. After I got used to my uh, new neighborhood, I just didn't want to be there at freaking uh, walking around anything. It was that. Depressing. Depressing. Yeah. Yeah. It was very yeah. depressing. And it was a depressed area as well. It's just yeah. you know, they liked it because their friends were there, their memories were there. their child. I guess when my brothers looked at that park, they had memories. I didn't have any. Fuck, I you know, I, I couldn't care less, you know. Yeah, but, and, uh, and as you mentioned before, you know, very densely populated for anyone that's not familiar with Bushwick. I mean, in some other parts of Brooklyn as well. I mean, Brooklyn is many neighborhoods of Brooklyn are like this where you'll have a long block and the whole block is connected uh, what you would call maybe brownstones or townhouses, whatever you, you would call them. And they're all connected in one long row that spans an entire block, one on one side, one across the street on the other side. I mean, you could literally have 500 to a thousand people living on one block when you talk Very about, when you're talking about people living on top of each other. And then you talk about block after block. So, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't only imagine what my father went through. And not only that, when he came to this country, he he he, he worked at Mount Sinai Hospital in Spanish Harlem, and he would take four trains to go to work. Wow. And I think about that for a person that was at the time um, 48 years old. You know, he had me when he was 46. Well, my parents, oh, wow. my mom was 36. And can you imagine being 48 years old and uh, you, you're, <laughs> you're taking four trains to get to work? And he was a maintenance man in uh, Mount Sinai. He did that for about nine years and then he retired. But, I mean, that's just, if you're talking about cultural shock, I, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, yeah. When you're my age, you, don't, you, you ain't doing anything. You don't do shit. You, know, you, yeah. you want to ride it back of ice cream truck. You know? <laughs> um, but that that was it. You know, uh, I, re I remember uh, 
a lot of good stuff coming out of the, that area that that built character, uh, I'd say. You there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I just want to close out this the Maria Hernandez story. Obviously, it's a it's a extremely tragic story in, in New York City uh, criminal history. Yeah. Ultimately, um, you have this guy, William Figueroa, also known as Willie Bundles. This is a name he had on the street. So him, along with another guy by the name of Harry Santiago, these are guys, young guys, early 20s, Frank, who right. get arrested for, for this homicide. And these guys, Harry Santiago ends up with a 48 to life. No, Harry Santiago ends up with a 36 to life. And Willie Bundles ends up with a 46 to life for the death of uh, Maria Hernandez. And today you sp we mentioned Bushwick Park, uh, Knickerbocker Park. Today it's known as Maria Hernandez Park, yeah. which is a, a big park in Bushwick. And it was actually right across the street from your family's coffee shop there on 274 Knickerbocker. Right directly um, across the street. Yep. Right directly across the street. So today, if you guys go there, it's known as you'll see the sign. Maria Hernandez Park on the thumbnail of this video, you'll see that I put up the uh, the sign there. Um, into the 90s, Frank, do you recall what was going on? Uh, how much of this stuff was really lingering on? I mean, when when do you think it started to kind of calm down a little bit? Do you think, I mean, we no, know in the 2000s. I, know. I, mean, I left the neighborhood in, jeez, uh, uh, I would say 2000. The, the last time I left the neighborhood, I when I got arrested, so you figured 2002, and the neighborhood, the coffee shop was no longer there. I think it had not been there for at least uh, three to four years. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe my brother sold the place because he, uh, it was his place. He sold it or he rented it, something. I don't remember. But we, so, and the neighbor was still pretty shitty, okay? It wasn't as bad. It was getting a little bit better, but it was definitely not um, looking like it looks anything like today. I mean, if the poor woman, Maria Hernandez, could open up her eyes and see what that neighborhood is like now, she wouldn't believe she'd probably have a big smile on her face. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, Rest in peace to Maria Hernandez. Yeah, she fought. Oh. The, absolutely. Absolutely. She was a warrior. She fought. And she paid with her life just to, to so people can have what they have today in the Kabaka Avenue and Bushwick. So, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think this conversation, as I said earlier, it's important because you know, especially you know, I have a bit of a diverse audience, but especially in like this genre, you know, with the mob tube and the mafia stuff, you know, the the thing with Bushwick, it's like Carmine Galante hit maybe bananas. I know we had a conversation. Maybe a Patsy Connie had some Sicilian Gambinos there. Whatever it may be, that's like the reference. That's where the brain goes to for a lot of people who think of that neighborhood from a, a mafia perspective, which right. is a lot of people in this space on YouTube. But it's important to know the the reality for for many people who are actually living there. I mean, and this is the reality for many people. This is this is. You came here when you were two years old. This is a neighborhood that you were entering into. Um, right. You you see all this destruction. Like I said, it looks like a war torn hellhole, and this is New York City, and it's 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 incredibly hard to fathom. If you had one memory, Frank, like one thing that you can take away from being in Bushwick from let's say two to nine years old, and then visiting often throughout the eighties. You said something before about building character. Can you expand on that? Is that something maybe you can take away from? Uh, I think Bushwick? it was by default with all the, it prepared me for a lot of bad things in life that can happen. But, you know, um, we didn't discuss it, but I, 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 I'll keep it brief. I lost a brother on the, on, on, in Bushwick, and not in Bushwick, it's actually uh, out of state, but in 77, that was the house we all lived in. And so that, that, almost killed my family, but it made us stronger, you know, at, at yeah. that time. So that's that's one of the sad events that occurred to us during that time. It's just, it, it was a perfect storm. We were getting hit with every fucking thing. Um, and, and you know, when we moved out of Ridgewood, just looked, moved to Ridgewood, it looked like things were starting to get better.
but it built character, made it strong. And what I mean, but we just a strong character. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting when you look at like who stays and who goes like, you know, cause you still had family that stayed there. It kind of mirrors my, a little bit of my well, family. Most friends and, you know, my family yeah. would go back. I mean, I had family, I had property there. I had family who would still shop there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was, that's what it was. Yeah, you know, it, it, like I was going to say, it reminds me a little bit of some of the like the family history on, on my my dad's side of the family. My dad is Puerto Rican. He grew up in the South Bronx. Um, but, you know, by the 1970s, he was like, to hell with this. He went over to Brooklyn, but most of his family stayed in the Bronx and most of them are still there till today, you know? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah and it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. one it, of those things, amazing. man. Um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine not too long ago, and he told me that there's a certain individual that still lives on Himrod and uh, on that block where we grew up. I was like, you got to be fucking shit. Is that right? A real yeah, old timer? So look at him. He looks like a champ now because that's the neighborhood, right? There you go. And they man. own their house. So I, I'm like, well, good for him, man. But damn, he, I remember seeing him in the 80s and the 90s and he used to be. Um, I haven't talked to him in years, but another individual was telling me he still lives there. And, and he was and he was like, well, nobody bothers me on my block because everybody knows me on my block. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but I couldn't yeah. do it. You know, well, I mean, listen, <laughs> I advise anybody, you know, it, it's hard to, to see it unless you're actually there. But go on Google, Google Street View. Take a walk through Bushwick. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it doesn't look that bad. I mean, you're going to see some areas, but you're going to see a lot of bars, a lot of hip little taco spots, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's kind of what's been going on there the last uh, 10 years. It's com completely different. I know right on the corner, we speak about the Galante hit on that same block. There's like a fancy little hipster bar with a nice backyard. And, you know, it's completely yeah, different. I, I, yeah, I hear it's very Bohemian. Um, yeah, there you go, Bohemian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, I learned the <laughs> word. I, I, everywhere I've lived ever since uh, get going into the program and uh, leaving New York seems like it's Bohemian. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I understand, but mm. but uh, yeah, it's surprising. Like I said, maybe this woman didn't die for no reason. You know, yeah. things happen for reasons sometimes, bad or good, and. This is, no, yeah. uh, knowing that that Bushwick is what it is today, it makes me feel good too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, it's one of those things when you're a New Yorker, it's like you always have. I mean, even me, like I always think of like how things were when I was a young teen in the early 2000s going into Manhattan when I wasn't supposed to at like 14 or 15 years old, going around sure. the West Village, getting in trouble. Sure. You know, and, and even it's from then to now, different. it's completely different. It's right. another universe. It's another universe. Oh, oh, you, yeah. you know, in fifteen to twenty, you know, it's just a completely another universe. But I think as New Yorkers, we kind of have this thing where even if it was bad back then, we have this oh, I miss old New York. It's something that's like in us, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and there was this Chinese restaurant right there on Knickerbocker Avenue that I missed too. It was on a second floor um, above a toy store, I, I believe that I used to. Like going to as a kid, and now right upstairs is this uh, uh the, the uh, Chinese restaurant, and it was pretty good. It wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Very fond memories, but I also had sad yeah. memories, and uh, I don't know. Good. Mem they were. They were different. Just different memories. Yeah. Yeah. And with missing, uh, you know, old New York, I mean, at, at the very least, you know, at least the neighborhoods are safer. Um, the demographics have changed, you know, people from, as we said, other parts of the country who have no reference to yeah. really what came before them. And, um, you know, they changed the makeup of a neighborhood. But, I, you know, as long as neighborhoods are safe, I suppose, and, you know, people don't have to walk through Zombieville and, you know. Right on. Yeah. And, you know, no, kids absolutely. can grow up, you know, kids can grow up in a safe neighborhood. You know, that's all that matters, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it was a different time for sure, a different time. Yeah. And uh, right. yeah, that was good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think we covered, you know, a lot of uh, good stuff, uh, Frank. 
Cool, cool, cool. You know, from the arsons to even into the 80s, the Maria Hernandez situation. And like I said, this is important history uh, not to forget. And I really appreciate you coming on. I know you're not doing many interviews anymore. Um, maybe we can do it again. I know we didn't really speak about your entry into organized crime. I really didn't want to talk about that. I don't know how much you wanted to talk about that today, but. I think, you know, I, I got a lot out of this conversation, Frank. I really appreciate no, it. No, I mean, I enjoy your show. I watch it. I'm a fan. Um, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of mob content, yeah. believe it or not. <laughs> um, this is stuff. I always liked history as a kid, and this is this is a great – I love New York history. I like everything about yeah. New York. I love 70s New York movies. I've spoken about that before. Yeah. Um, you know, Sidney Lament is one of my favorite New York, um, Scorsese, you know, they covered a lot yeah. of the movies. So, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm all about New York City. And when, and when you talk about, you, you bring back, you bring me back to memory lane, you know, uh, it's nostalgic. I remember the crime. Some I do remember, some I didn't know happened at all. Yeah. And and that's good. Keep doing that's good work. And yeah, I would love to come on your show again, especially if, um, talking about this kind of stuff. I don't mind it. Awesome, man. I really appreciate that. And um, if you could just hang out backstage uh, for a minute while I end the recording. Sure. And, um, everybody, thank you for uh, listening. I hope you guys um, enjoyed this conversation. Um, I would say that if you were just listening, maybe come back and watch because, you know, it's a, it was a very visual conversation. We looked at some really cool photos. We played some video and you guys can get a real sense of what was going on back then in Bushwick in the 1970s leading into the 1980s. Everybody, you guys have a great week. Remember to like, subscribe and tell everybody that, you know, who is interested in New York City criminal history, mob history, anything to do with New York City. Come and check out NYC Crime Spot. Thanks a lot, people. Thank you for having me.